Uh, greetings to you all. Today's teaching I have titled um, Let Us Make Man in Our Image and this comes out of Genesis chapter 1 verses 26 to 27 um, and it reads um, Then God said Let us make human beings in our image and likeness and let them rule, have dominion over the fish in the sea and the birds in the air um, over the tame animals, that is the beasts, the livestock, over all the earth and over all the small crawling animals of the earth. So he bequeathed the earth to man. He gave them dominion and control of everything over his creation. Um, then 27 continues, so God created human beings. Um, in his image reflecting God's nature, character and representing him in the world. In the image of God he created them. He created them male and female. 27 from the um, the message translation reads, then God spoke, let us make human beings in, a, in our image, um, make them reflecting our nature so that they can be responsible for the fish in the sea the birds in the air, the cattle, and yes, the earth itself, and every animal that moves on the face of the earth. God created human beings. He created them godlike. Um, so in our image and our likeness, we were godlike. That was his intention, thus um, reflecting God's nature. Uh, he created uh, us male and female, and he blessed us. And he told us to prosper, reproduce, and fill the earth, take charge, be responsible for the fish in the sea and the birds in the air, for everything that moves on the face of the earth. So, so we are created in his image. But he, because everything with God is well planned and thought, uh, is, he knows the end from the beginning. So he created us. Um, in the form that we're in, in a physical body, um, with an erect, stu uh, erect stature. Yeah, I think. And so with the, and I think that's what we resemble him in in that respect as well. Uh, that we are erect, and um, the, this body is this shape because we're the only human. The only, we are the only creatures that walk on two legs the way we are. The others, yes, some of them can walk temporarily, but not permanently. We don't walk on any on all fours at any point. So we are different from all other creatures in the agreement, and the idea is that um, the body that we have was looking forward and was prepared in covenant for the Son of God, and because it was agreed that at some point in the future he should assume in the fullness of time and in the immortality of his soul and in his intellectual powers and in that purity, holiness and righteousness in which he was created as well as in his dominion, power and authority over the creatures in which he was as God's vice regent and resembled him. So this body was created with Christ in view that he was going to come in such a body at a later stage and that, that's how far forward he was looking. And, uh, but in the meantime, man had been created as God's vice regent on earth and resembled him, but knowing that, that he would not be able to fulfill the God's expectation and that Christ would have to step in uh, to correct everything. So in 28 it continues, God blessed them, and then he told them to have the, uh, the uh, uh, fill the, uh, multiply and fill the earth with human beings. It's something that we are doing most of it uh, not very well because um, the the earth now is full of we kill more of our children than we've ever done, and uh, the other human people who look like humans who are not humans who are with us here on earth. Um, Having said that, so so his man's Adam's spiritual understanding is that he saw divine things clearly and truly as and he distinguished them, the divine 
from the flesh and its appetizing proclivities. At first our parents were happy and holy as they imag imaged God on earth and God's residence, but we know that God was resides in heaven, but we imaged him here on earth uh, for a while. Uh, but how was the, this image of God upon man defaced? That was, it came through sin. Because man sinned, he fell from God's grace. Um, he lost everything and handed over everything to Satan because of that fall. So God decided to redeem man, and um, who has, um, who is now being held prisoner? Who was he being held prisoner by the law? In fact, the whole world is bound in sin, except, except for the blood of Jesus and God's grace. We would all be dead. But here's uh, an interesting point, which I think is very encouraging. Uh, this comes out of Isaiah 54:1. Um, he's talking about then God says, sing Jerusalem, you are like a woman um, who never gave birth to children, start singing and shout for joy. You never felt the pain of giving birth, but you will have more children than the woman who has a husband. So we, the marriage stuff has not happened for us, so we don't, the, the woman does not have a husband. But Satan's children are the ones who have a husband, which is Satan and is, is procreating here on earth in that sense, because the world is his. But he's saying that in the end, the Jerusalem is going to have more children than the woman with who has a husband. In the end, God's numbers are going to be greater than Satan's numbers. Many, many people are not, okay, it says few are going to make it, yes. But according to this, there are going to be, uh, Jerusalem's children are going to be more than Satan's children. But then that's an aside. We'll continue. So the, t the teaching of scripture is that death entered the world through sin. And, and this merely f um, proves that um, the human race was created for eternal life. Uh, we failed in, the, in that respect. So man has, was made, we know that man was made last. And that God, by indulging us with a body of clay, and planting in planting it with his spirit um, pitted us in one action in a state of war the sublime and the base or the beauty and the beast good and evil light and darkness um, We were in a war instantly because the flesh tends to pull us down, the spirit wants to take us up. So this is a, a war zone that no one can escape because we need to overcome the flesh, which is basically the base side of us. And in the spirit, it's a question of one will win over the other. One, one has to be able to win. They can't both be victors. There's a loser and a, a winner. And so in Matthew 16, 18, it says, So I tell you, Peter, he's talking to Peter, Peter now, he's saying, on the church, on the, on, based on the church, on this rock, I will build my church, and the power of death, the gates of Hades, the underworld, will not be able to prevail or defeat or overcome or prevail against it. They are not going to destroy the church. The church will survive, and it will do all that it was intended to do. In Ecclesiastes now, coming back to the point that we we touched on earlier, it says in class Ecclesiastes uh, three two, it says, "Who can be sure? Who knows that the human spirit goes up above that goes up above, and that the spirit of the animal goes down into the earth? So the flesh has got its own spirit." And then there's the Spirit of God that was put in us because we are created uniquely. He breathed it into us. In other words, the, I think it's um, 
Zechariah says that um, he forms the spirit within the body. Uh, so we have a spirit in us, which is the spiritual side, and, but then the flesh has also got a spirit because the spirit also, the, the flesh doesn't want to die. It fights. I mean, you see wild animals, they don't want to, they don't kind of surrender and say, uh, lion, you can eat me today, they will run for their lives. So there's a desire to live. So there's a spirit there. So there are two spirits in a way. The flesh is the one that is wrestling against the, the spirit. The, the flesh or the spirit of the body is fighting against the spirit, God's spirit, trying to pull it down and we are trying to subdue it. Ecclesiastes 12, 7 reads, um, but we know that the body itself, when we die, it goes back to the earth and the spirit returns to God who gave it. So man was to be a creature different from all, all of the, the uh, other creatures created. Um, flesh and blood, heaven and earth must be put together in him. So flesh and blood, that was heaven, the flesh is earth, and heaven, the spirit, they were put together in, 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 this, or in, in, in one, um, in the flesh. Yeah, the, the, the spirit was put in the flesh and uh, God said, let us um, make man. Uh, when he was made, he was there to glorify the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But there's a constant battle there. Because the true one is trying to subdue the other. The other one is trying to... There's the, the antagonistic. The, the spirits, they are in a state of antagonism. They, they fight naturally. I think an example of this would be um, in the case of Rebecca when those the two the twins were fighting within her womb. Yeah, that would be a good example of the antagonism between the flesh and the spirit. And but we know that before Adam's fall, that he used to fraternize, he used to fellowship with God. They used to meet in the coolness of the day. That is in Genesis three eight. Um, to, to build up the spirit because the, the spiritual side of us is what is more important rather than the flesh, fleshly side of us. So we used to meet and fellowship with God our Father. And, uh, and whilst that was going and before we had fallen and everything was good, Ecclesiastes 7.29 says that one thing I have learned that Solomon is, is that, um, that he has found is that that God made people good, but they have found all kinds of ways to be bad. So God's intention is that everything that he created was good, was very good. We just found finding ways to be bad. And I think it's basically when we respond to the flesh, and the flesh has got its own desires and it wants to be independent. And I think this is weak, the, it's what wants to be independent of the spirit. And this is the struggle that I think Eve had. She wanted to be independent of God. Uh, I have suggested in a, another teaching is that Hava, because she had to wait for a child and she didn't want to wait, she thought that the independence way, if she didn't have to rely on Christ, on God, she could just have babies whenever she wanted because that was the whole idea, then you can become like God, because she saw the other animals, they were having babies, and, but she had to wait. Um, I think Adam uh, was like, um, his attitude was basically more like, um, what is his name, Jacob, when uh, Rebecca was complaining about her being uh, childless, and he says, am I in the place of God? Whereas Isaac, when he heard the same thing, he he got onto his knees and started praying. When it took him 20 years, um, Abraham, it took him 25 years. So the question is that we talked about earlier that what is God's nature? Um, what is God's nature? Okay, so as the new creation is only a restoration of this image, that this is what is happening now. The history of the one uh, throws light on the other, and we are informed that it is it is renewed after the image of God 
in knowledge, righteousness, and in true holiness. So this is what we lost. So we, we were now behaving like base animals because we fell from grace, and all of us are in this kingdom of Satan. And we had fallen. That's why God kind of takes us out and cleans us out. Um, so that is the image that God wants to have the image of God in his knowledge and his understanding, his righteousness and his holiness and this and his love. And this is, it comes out very clearly in the New Testament. This is God wants, that he is holy. Be holy as I am holy. In uh, Colossians 3, 10 to 11 it reads, you have begun to live a new life in which you have been made new in the true knowledge of God and are becoming like the one who created you, which is what happened, which was the state and condition that Adam was when he was created. Um, in the new life, but for us now we are finding a new life because our old life is one of, um, um, of this world, uh, this evil, the wicked world, which is where God takes us from and cleans us up. You, um, in the true knowledge of God, it continues. In, in the new world, in the new life, there is no difference. Okay, so we are becoming like, according to the image of God who created us. In, in the new life, there is no difference between now you're saying basically, uh, it doesn't matter whether you are Hebrew or Greek, whether you are circumcised or not circumcised, whether you are black or white, whether you are whatever it is, we all become one being, we become Christ-like. Um, this is the image that God wants. This is the image that the post God is that we need is and God is righteous and he's holy. Ephesians four twenty three to twenty four it reads, But you were taught to be made new in your hearts, to become to put on, clothe yourself with a new self. That a new person is created to be like God in God's image truly good and holy truly good and holy so this these are the, the value systems of uh, that is our nature that's the nature that we of god and god's kingdom has is has citizens who are like-minded we are like him in every way because he, there can be no dissension we like the same things we we have same values we are loving and we do everything as he does as he would do um, so holiness and righteousness is the nature that we want to focus on and if um in matthew 5 47 to 48 degrees and if you are nice only to your friends you are no better than other people, even those who don't know God are nice to their friends. So therefore you must be perfect just as the Father is perfect. So we should not choose when we are Christ-like. We are Christ-like, it's our, our nature. It should just exude from us, it should be it just pour out from us, because that's the way we are. And then in Matthew 19, 21, he says, if you want to be perfect, uh, he was telling this man who was saying that I do everything right, I fast twice a day. He says, oh, well, okay, um, if you want to be truly perfect, uh, go and sell all your possessions and, um, and, uh, and then go uh, sell your possessions and give the money to the poor and you will have you store up treasure in heaven and then you can come and follow me. So he's talking about a higher level where we don't attach ourselves to these earthly um, material rewards. Now I'm not, I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with them, but he's saying that if you really want to be perfect, what you want to do is to be heaven bound, is to have your heart and your mind fixated on heaven above. Because the, where your treasure is, is where your heart is. But he was torn between his earthly material goods and um, he didn't like the idea of losing them. Uh, so that made him sad. In John 17, 25, 26, he says, um, this is Jesus saying, speaking, he says, Father, as you are the one who is good, righteous, the world does not know you, but I know you, 
and these people know you sent me. I have shown, I showed them what you are like, and I will show them again, and I'll continue to make it known to them. Uh, then they will have the same love that we have. They will have the same love that you have for me, and I will live, be in them. So basically, the other component of it is as um, holiness, righteousness, and we're talking about love that we love each other. And then he exhibited this when he was on earth, the washing of the feet, this whole concept, the idea of servant, uh, servitude, to serve one another, to want to see other people prosper. Um, this intercessionary um, nature, to where he was praying for the people on the cross, even though he was suffering himself, he prayed for other people, for their salvation. So, this is basically the nature of God. And I think it's in one of Paul's letters, I think it's probably Corinthians, maybe two or maybe one, where he's saying that all these gifts that we are given, at the end of it, when everything is uh, said and done, the thing that will remain is love. And that's what God is. He says God is love. So talking about his physical um, appearance, the physical representation image, we tend to give the impression that we're talking about a physical presentation, uh, an image of a person, um, one's appearance. So this is Christ now talking about, he was asked the question whether it is right to pay taxes to Caesar or not. Of course, it was a trick question. And then in, in the end, he says, bring me a denarius and um, show me this denarius. And he says, um, then the man, and then he asked him, uh, whose image or likeness or portrait and the name inscription uh, is on the coin? And he answered, Caesar's. Then he answered and he says, um, he says, he said to him, give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and give to God the things that are gods because here it's a bit very simple we're talking about an image the coin is basically the babylon uh, system so you do what is required in babylon um which, uh, as long as it doesn't go against that the spiritual and you serve god in spirit you, know? you worship him in spirit in your uh, yeah you worship in you worship in and you live the spiritual life you are led by the spirit that, that doesn't normally come into conflict with earthly things, except of course now as we get into the beast system because he's going to force you to make a choice. So, but basically the image here, the image, the, the appearance, the word of image here it gives an idea of an appearance, likeness, a portrait or something. Now the question is, he says, let's make man in our image. What does it mean? So there's been a, this has been a source of much debate. One group holds the view that uh, there is no distinction. They're just synonymous, uh, synonymous these words, likeness and uh, image. And they're used together merely to, to add intensity to the thought or for uh, the poetic uh, impact of it all. And the other group see a clear distinction. The latter group suppose that um, in our image to represent a physical aspect to, of the likeness of God and after the likeness and likeness, the image refer, refers to his physical aspect and the likeness to the ethical and moral aspects and highlights and points to his unique nature. Um, the former group argue an image which is like us, is really meaningless, uh, as I said earlier, and is possibly just, um, it's just added together for the, um, perhaps for, to add intensity to, to, to the whole scripture. But if we go to the scripture itself, talking about image, we have in John 6, 40, uh, 46, it reads, no one has seen the Father except the one who is from the Father. This is Jesus talking. 
uh, only he has seen the Father. So to see someone, he, there must be some image, a portrait. I mean, it, it's the same thing we, we saw in Exodus, where he says uh, in Exodus 33, 20, he says, but you cannot see me, you cannot see my face uh, because no one can see me and live because he's so holy. You would just drop dead. Um, so God has an image. Whether the people cannot conceive of um, a spirit having a face, they must have a face. The fact that you cannot see them doesn't, de doesn't mean that they, 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 they don't have an appearance. They don't have a, um, a portrait. They, 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 they are not real. Um, in John 14, 9, he talks about the same, the same thing again. He says, um, no, one has, uh, no one has seen me. Whoever is talking about now, of course, he's likening now. He's talking about his nature to a question. He says, uh, it's how Philip was saying, uh, show us the Father. And he says, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. So why do you ask to show for me to show you the Father. So basically here he's talking about the, another aspect of it. There is the physical side of it, there is the spiritual side of it. Uh, what his nature, and I think he's the nature of Jesus because he's the exact uh, replica, exact image of his Father, is what he showed us, to, that that's what he was when he came down on earth, he exhibited God the Father. And, um, and that's it, he's an exact image of his father. Uh, here, that is the nature that he's talking about, not necessarily the appearance, because the appearance he didn't bring it down with him, except I think when we saw the transfiguration. So, the discussion now about whether the discussion of the form of God's body, the, It's a question of whether in deciding in what the likeness of uh, God consisted, cert consists, certainly not, some argue that it's certainly not in the bodily form or the upright uh, posture um, or the commanding, well, yeah, the upright posture of a man. It is said that God, because some people ask, say that God does not have a body, I don't know whether that makes any sense. Um, the fact that he's invisible to you and his spirit doesn't mean that he doesn't have a body, he just doesn't have a body like we have. Um, because are we, our body is formed from the dust and the spirit is inside us. And he gave us, he formed a spirit, created for us a body of flesh and blood and he put his spirit within us. So, God is Man is an image of God by virtue of his spiritual nature. That's what they would like to limit it to. Um, for the breath of God, by which, <clears throat> by what he's saying that basically the spirit was put into man by the breath of God. Um, but we know from Zechariah that uh, man's spirit is uh, formed within his body. And, and, uh, at the instant, and in the creation process, yes, it was done that way, but thereafter, he puts it naturally. The minute an egg is fertilized, the spirit appears. So the breath of God became the soul of man. The, the Bible, my understanding is that sometimes the words soul and spirit are used interchangeably. Uh, whether that is so or not, and they're saying that the soul represents the emotions, the intellect, and then the spirit is, is the spirit. But the breath of God becomes, became the soul of man. This is one view. And the soul of man, therefore, is nothing but the breath of God. And I don't know whether that is so. The rest of the world, uh, of the world um, exists through the word of God, man through his own peculiar breath. Right, this is what they want to draw distinction, the soul. The breath is the seal and the pledge of our relationship to God. 
and our godlike dignity, whereas the breath of the animals is nothing but a common breath. Uh, is to be distinguished, uh, like we mentioned earlier, that um, this flesh has got its own spirit. That's why it is able to fight. The uh, it's got its own intentions and it's got its own val principles and values and priorities. Um, so this distinction now uh, we mentioned it earlier that you know uh, it talks about the human spirit that goes down and then. The spirit of um, the spirit of you no, know, the human spirit goes up, and the spirit of the animal goes down to the ground with the corpse when it dies. Um, so the animal soul is nothing but a nature soul. And then Hebrews 4:12 now is saying that these two they seem to be so closely intertwined. It, it talks about uh, that God's word is alive and working and is sharper than a double-edged sword. It cuts all the way into us where the soul and the spirit are joined. In the center of uh, our joints and bones, saying that it's cut so finely, that here what he's saying that the soul and the spirit are very, are very closely entwined. They are joined together. That is almost difficult to distinguish them. And I think that's why maybe some texts refer to soul as spirit and, uh, and so forth. But anyway, th that is another, day, another discussion. Uh, what I want to focus on more is uh, the, Im the image or the likeness of God in terms of his spiritual personality, the spiritual personality of man. Though not limited to self-consciousness and self-determination, we have free will. For, for this consciousness and self-determination um, of the human personality is merely a basis for the divine likeness, not its essence. This consists, this consists rather in his spiritual as well as his corporal nature. A copy is a copy and of holiness and righteousness and blessedness of our, father, of our Father. That's what we are. We are a copy. We are supposed to be an, ex, an exact image in the end. This concrete essence of the divine likeness um, was shattered by sin when we fell. And it is only through Christ um, the brightness of the glory of God and the expression of and the expression of his essence that has recovered, um, restored us back to what we were originally created, or made it possible for us to regain what we had lost. But it still has to be fought for, it has to be worked for. And in Hebrews, we were talking about when Christ came down, he says, the sun reflects the glory of God and shows exactly what God is like. He is the exact representation imprint stamp of, the, of his being, the essence and his nature. He holds everything together, sustains, upholds all things with his powerful word. When the sun made people clean from their, from their sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, the God Great One in heaven. Um, so, we are talking trying we are talking restoration here recovery we are recovering um, he is recovering the good works that fell and he had to find a way of um, uh, restoring us back to what was the original intention so that he could have his family of uh, human beings but as spiritual people, because God is spirit, he's more concerned about spiritual things. That is why when people wake up, you have a resurrection body, which is not flesh and blood as we are right now. Uh, in Romans 8:29, it says, God knew them before he made the world, and he chose us. He also predestined us to be like, to be molded in the pattern or conform to the image of his son. And we know that the son is an exact representation of his father. So that's why I'm saying the whole kingdom of God 
is having people like-minded people where your mind has to be renewed we are we we don't have any deviant behavior in the kid in the kingdom we don't we have a paradigm of um, a conception value system that is consistent um, so that our nature is transformed into the image of God and our blueprint is Christ Jesus so we are supposed to emulate and imitate Christ in um, Colossians 3 10 it says um, You, you have begun to live a new life, this is when you are coming back to Christ, in which you were made new in the true knowledge of God, according to the image of the one who created you. So we are going back to what we were supposed to be, we were created to be. Ephesians 4, 23-24 reads, But you were taught to be made new in your heart, your spirit, your attitude of your mind to become, to put on, clothe yourself in the new person to become like Christ. That new person is created to be like God or in God's image, uh, to be truly good and holy and righteous and holiness comes from truth. So this is what, this is the work that is going on that God is doing in us to be making us like himself that's the only way you can gain entry into his kingdom nothing less than that will suffice uh, in Ephesians 4 uh, 4 13 it reads uh, this work must continue until we are all joined together in the same faith or we'll all reach the unity in the faith and in the same knowledge of the Son of God we must become like a mature person, perfect, like Christ, growing until we become like Christ and have his perfection. And then we are not swayed left, right and center when we have all these trials and tribulations. So Christ is like the Father. We are supposed to become like Christ. Basically then, because we have become like Christ, we are like God. And um, that is... That is the kingdom citizen or subject. Citizen, that we all think alike. And uh, because of sin, now this is why I think it's very difficult to, to teach anything about God, about Christ, about the kingdom without talking about the, what caused the breakdown, which is sin. We can't talk about God without talking about sin because this is what we are grappling with. Fighting the sin nature. Uh, before we even talk about prosperity, um, we need to repent and to recover and to be cleaned up of sin because by, we are sinful creatures by nature. We have a sinful nature. So even if you want to talk about prosperity, maybe the prosperity we want to talk about is not so much the material one, but the spiritual one. Those, the ones that are pure, the ones that are going to inherit the kingdom. We want to have the spiritual, uh, that's the prosperity that we should be looking for in the first instance. How to get into heaven. Not how many cars that you have, uh, the number of cars that you have, or the number of suits, I mean, that's not that's hardly important so we can't talk about getting into into heaven or getting into the kingdom without talking about sin and the repentance repenting of it there's just no way you cannot we can, can cannot be done so any teaching that does not talk about sin i think is a false teaching and it's very shallow because our struggle is that of sin What is preventing us from becoming like Christ is sin. When it gets hold and it solidifies and it cannot, it cannot be shaken off us, we end up going um, Satan's way. If we, are, with God's help of course, uh, we're able to shake it off, we, go, we get into the kingdom of God. 
the, ever, uh, the unending um, the kingdom without end. Now, talking about why sin is so critical is that's what fell, that's why we fell from grace, fell from glory, because of sin. In Isaiah 64, 6, it says, All of us are dirty with sin. All the right things that we have done, our righteous deeds are like filthy pieces of cloth, rags, garments, or menstrual cloth. All of us are. We faint and shrivel like dead leaves, and our sins and iniquities, like the wind, have carried us away. So sin is the problem. And this is what the struggle is here on earth, fighting against sin to break away from that rhythm. In Isaiah 30, 22, it talks about enlightening a, and one of the key ones, I think, in my view. It says, then you will, this is Isaiah 30, 22, it says, then you will ruin, destroy, desecrate your statues, your statues, Covered, covered with silver and gold, you will throw them away like filthy rags and clean things, menstrual cloth, and say, go away. Now, this is one of the problems that Israel, Yashael, suffered greatly from idolatry. Even though the Israel were taken out of Egypt by with his outstretched arm and showed his great power, his love, no sooner were we in the Sinai thing, we had, we had um, melted a, and shaped a molten calf of gold and we were dancing right under him, under, uh, at the base of the mountain, whilst Moses was on the mountain. So what is important is that we need to break away from sin to be cleansed of it. Because we fell away, we need to be cleansed back to be restored to what we were created to be. And in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says, If anyone belongs to Christ, there is a new creation. The new creation has arrived. Or oh, that person has become a new creation. The old things have gone. Everything is made new. The new has come. It's restoration in a way because we've now been taken out of the filth and are being cleaned up to be what we were created to be in the first place. Now, talking about these value systems that we are talking about in Amos 4 2, it talks about that God has promised, sworn this, just as surely as I am holy, I am a holy God. The time will come when you will be taken away, when you will be taken away by hooks or in baskets, and that and what is left of you with fish hooks. So here the point I want to highlight here is that God is saying that I am a holy God. In John 17, 11, Jesus says, uh, I am coming to you. I will not stay in this world from I am coming to you. I will not stay in the world any longer. But they are still, he's talking to his father, but they are still in the world, holy father. So we know that the God and father is holy. And we also know that Christ is also holy. Um, if this is a, in Mark, so be holy as I am holy. In Mark 1, 2, 1, 24, it reads, um, Jesus of Nazareth, what do you want? This is a demon talking to him. He says, um, I know you, God's holy one. So it is known. So God is holy. Christ is holy. Christ is exactly like his father, his nature. Um, this is Zachariah now, even as prophesying of uh, Christ. He says um, that he would save us from the power of our enemies so that we would serve him without fear being holy and good righteous before God as long as we live. So this is what is required to be holy and righteous before God. In Matthew 5, 48, it reads, Therefore you must be perfect just as the Father in heaven is perfect in holiness and righteousness. So, 
so I I I I I, I don't really want to to focus on the other aspect of it, which is the imagery side of it. But in the likeness, in the, in the nature, is that what is in critical, that is what is going to save us. Unless we become like him, holy and righteous, and cleanse ourselves from sin, stay away from sin, we cannot enter the kingdom of God. And any teaching that tends to highlight anything else before it's dealt with the base is, is, is misleading. It truly is misleading. He says in Matthew 5:48, "So you must be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect, just like this is Christ now, just like I am perfect." This is Christ Jesus now talking again to the Father. He says, "I will be in them, and you will be in me." Now, this is what he's saying now. This is the template. I will be in them, and you will be in me. He's judged them to be righteous and holy, right? Um, they have not reached full perfection. I think that happens when we get into heaven or at the resurrection. Um, in them and you in me, so that they will be completely, so that they will be completely one in perfection and unity. The world will know that you said, um, then the world, okay, he's saying basically here, uh, I will be in them, Christ will be in us, just as the Father is in him. And so that they will be, will be in complete unity, a perfect unity. So he cannot come in you unless you are striving in that direction of perfection, of, of holiness and, and, um, and righteousness. That's the only basis that he can come to you, that you are making strides in that regard. So this is the perfect unity that he's talking about. And unless you are striving in that direction and are moving in that direction, they cannot come. He cannot be in you. And therefore also the Father cannot be, you, you don't have the Father and you don't have the Son. That is why we talked about uh, Matthew 19:21. The man, when he was told that, that if you want to be perfect and complete in every respect, sell your possessions and give your things to the poor and come and join me and, uh, um, yeah, and follow me. Because he did not want to focus, put, he did not want to put everything in heaven. He didn't want his heart to be focused on heaven. Where your heart is, is that is where you are so he wanted both and you're not prepared to go that far I'm not saying like I said earlier I'm not saying that people who are worth who are righteous shouldn't uh, be rich Abraham was very wealthy so was Isaac and so was uh, was Jacob there are many rich people David was and so was Solomon and of course I mean Solomon would, would, let's take him out of the equation because I think we might uh, get into some other discussion um, but the point is that if you committed to, to God, you put your all in Him and you will not mind so much uh, that you don't have any worldly possessions. And this is the, the, um, the theory behind uh, like, uh, the Catholic priests in the theory of it. Uh, um, is that you devote your entire life and you give it up to Christ. But you can do that without necessarily uh, denying yourself marriage. But I think it, it, it tends to give a graphic example of um, where you, you forsake everything and you become like a Nazarene and you devote and dedicate your life to, to God and God alone without any distractions, pretty much like uh, John the Baptist or like Elijah. So we know that, so everything we need to focus on heaven above. Um, uh, 
in Matthew, as I said earlier, uh, 17, 25, 26, he talks about the Father who is righteous. This is Christ, of course, talking about uh, uh, the Father. In John 1, 18, he says, no one has ever seen God, God the Father, who is pure spirit. Now, I think when we talk about pure spirit here, I think it tends to conjure up this whole idea that the spiritual realm is invisible. It, to the spirits, how can it be? They see each other. It's invisible to us. Just, um, okay, let me give you an, uh, a life ex experience here. I've known some people who can see people who are physical but have somehow been clothed with invisibility so that you don't see them. Most people will not see them, but they can see them. But because they could see them, they thought everybody could see what they were seeing and they were finding it very difficult to distinguish between the invisible and the, the, the invisible, the visible and the invisible, because everything was visible to them, insofar as human beings who are clothed with invisibility. So because they, they, they were just saying, thought that everybody was seeing them, you get into a situation and say, oh, be careful, you're just about to run someone over. But there was no one there. But there are people, human beings, who are clothed with invisibility. I don't know how it's done, but I'm just trying to highlight the fact that to the invisible world, the invisible is not invisible. There may be certain aspects or dimensions to it within the invisible world. But generally speaking, uh, Christ, when he was casting out demons, he could see them. He saw them. So, the fact that God is pure spirit does not mean he is invisible to us. Spirits are invisible to us, generally speaking. I don't know whether they're invisible to everybody, but generally speaking, they are invisible to us. There are other human beings that can be made to be invisible, that we, that we do not see them uh, when, they, when, they, when they don't want us to see them because of whatever they are doing, whether they're traveling by night or whatever they're doing is usually at night, that they uh, clothe themselves with this invisible cloak, whatever it is. Um, but anyway, that, that's another discussion. Um, that brings us now back to, that, uh, continue, um, that God is pure spirit, but God, the only son, God, the one and only, the only son who himself is God, the God, uh, God, the only begotten is very close by the side and close to the heart. He's talking about the heart of, in the bosom of his father. And he has shown us what God is like. He's made him known to us. And then that's why you are saying in, to Philip, why do you want to see the father? If you've seen me, you've seen the father because I'm an exact image replica of the father. And if you want to know what Christ is like, read the New Testament and emulate him. Yes, be an imitator of Jesus Christ. That's the way to heaven. Everything that he does and everything that he said you do. So, whilst we are on this earth, the way to becoming, uh, let us make man in our image. It was defaced, it was cut, it was cut short in a way, but it's the redemptive process has reinstated it, has recovered what was lost. Now, this whole thing is now to get back to where we were. Life is indeed a struggle to get back because we are now fighting the forces of darkness which don't want us to leave. They are saying, you cannot leave us, you cannot leave, I want this kingdom and I do everything that is on earth is mine. And now you are now saying, no, 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 I want to be with the Father, the Spirit. So the Spirit is now fighting the, spirits, uh, the, flesh, the Spirit of the flesh. 
because the flesh of this, uh, the spirit of the flesh wants to keep you, wants to keep us down here on earth. To die and to go to the lake of fire and brimstone. So this is the struggle. So we are fighting, uh, we are making, it's a, force, we are, it's a forceful and violent effort on our part to get free of restraint and to resist this holding back. We are fighting to dislodge, to free ourselves. We are making a violent, it has to be a violent and forceful effort to get free of restraint and constriction and this holding back, this force is trying to keep us in darkness. That's the only way now to be, let us make men in our image, to regain what was lost. This is the fight. And I said, as I said earlier, this fight is but we were pitted in it when the spirit was put in this human body. It's a state of war. It's a war zone. You immediately get involved in that fight one way or the other. You either capitulate or you fight on. You resist it. So the this lesson is basically this teaching is that basically let us not forget the fact, the point, that one, we fell from grace, from God's glory, to get back into the glory that we were created with in the first place to rest, for restoration, redemption to that state of, our, of, of affairs, is a fight, a vicious fight, a fight to the death, the, and sin is our biggest problem, not prosperity. Prosperity is secondary. In fact, it, perhaps it doesn't even feature anywhere on the list of what is important for us to do or to achieve in this life. The idea is to allow the Spirit to take us out of this sewage, the sewer of uh, Babylon into the kingdom of God, and it's a struggle. You need the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, to be able to do that. You cannot do it on your own. So the idea is to pray for the Holy Spirit, then to be led and be willing to be led by the Holy Spirit, to be taken out of captivity and from bondage. And on this note, I like, um, we come to our introspection and our meditation, and it's from the... Um, Revelation chapter 10, verses 8 to 11, um, it reads, Then I heard uh, the same voice from heavens, um, heaven again saying to me, Go and take the open, the open scroll that is in the hand of the angel that is standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel and told him to give me the small scroll, and he said to me, and, this, and, uh, and he said to me, take the, small, the scroll and eat it, which is a symbol of um, internalizing the word. It will be sour in your stomach uh, because it is a message of judgment, but in your stomach it will be sweet as honey because it is, of God's, it is God's word uh, and because it brings salvation and vindication to his people. So I took the small scroll from the angel's hand and ate it. In my mouth it tasted sweet as honey, but after I ate it, it was sour, bitter in my stomach. Then I was told, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. You must share the word you have just received. The last uh, verse from the contemporary uh, English version reads, um, then some voices said, keep on telling what will happen to the people of many nations, races, and languages, and also to kings. And our benediction comes out of Numbers 6, chapter 6, verses 22 to 27, and it reads, And the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron and his sons, This is how you should bless the Yasha Elites. Um, say to them, May the Lord bless you and keep you. 
May the Lord show you his kindness, uh, make his face shine upon you, and uh, may the Lord have mercy on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord watch over you, lift his face, presence, countenance upon you, and give you peace. So Aaron and his sons will bless the Yashaelites with my name, put my name upon the sons of Yashael, and I will bless them. Thank you, and may God bless you all.